You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. My guest is chiropractor Adam Bonenblust. He was born and raised in uh, the DFW Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, he goes by Dr. B. Uh, he completed undergraduate work at Tarrant County College in Hearst, Texas, uh, after graduating from Trinity High School in Euless. Uh, he has a doctorate of chiropractic from Parker University in Dallas. And we're going to talk about his work as a chiropractor and uh, you know how he helps people. So welcome, Dr. B. Thanks for coming. For having me. Tell me a bit about your history. What made you want to be a chiropractor? why this area? For sure. In junior high, I was playing football and I had a interesting tackle where three guys collided with me and I broke three of the vertebrae in my middle of my back. I ended up at the primary care physician and I said, there's not much they could do for me. And so my mother took me to her chiropractor. I had no clue what a chiropractor was or did. And he corrected it, improved my feeling significantly within moments and I knew that I wanted to do something like him. I wanted to work with my hands, I wanted to talk with people, and more more importantly, I wanted to work in the air conditioning. So <laughs> it seemed like a perfect situation for me. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So, well, you, some of your thoracic vertebrae, what well, were they just misaligned or were they, like, how bad was the damage? Pretty significant anterior collapse. So the front end of the bone broke down, and so I have wedged vertebrae in the middle of my back. So they're still perfect, but figured out how to manage it and take care of it through all my education. Well, I would guess you probably trade chiropractic with other practitioners. So is it hard for a normal chiropractor to work on you even today, years later? It does tend to be a lot more difficult to get that area on my back to move. There's a lot of scar tissue and muscle spasms that tend to hold it in place. But I train interns from the Parker University, and so I let them practice on me. Oh, well, they're able to do it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So they, so you went into chiropractic. Um, how long have you been doing it? Is there any particular specializations do you do like God instead or do you do like uh you know, diversify like what what type of chiropractic do you do let's see we've been in practice for 11 years i started this practice while i was still in school i've always worked under diversified type chiropractors i do have a lot of background in myofascial release i did go to massage school through parker oh man uh, 15 16 years ago so before i got to the chiropractic school and so i do a lot of soft tissue work on top of the regular diversified style adjusting Oh, so you don't go in and just tell them to lay down and start cracking away. First, you'll maybe try to release some tension around the vertebrae. Sure. Could okay. make it easier on both of us. Yeah. <laughs> well, what have you noticed? If chiropractors don't do that, they go in and they just try to crack somebody right away. What are some of the uh, problems that can occur from doing that? For sure. The first thing that I typically see is that if I don't release any of the muscle spasms, it's very difficult to achieve the adjustment. So we don't get anything to move or we only get one thing to move instead of two or three things that we're looking to get moving. And then secondary, they typically end up with a muscle spasm that's worse if we don't release the muscle spasm first. Yeah. And I guess people that are not familiar with getting adjusted, they'll, they're tense anyway. And they don't, you know, it takes a while. For people learn how to relax. I've been adjusted, you know, many, many times and I've gotten really good at relaxing, but I'm at the point now where I could tell where someone's setting up that's not going to go. I'm like, no, 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 wait, because things are not not released yet. Because I know it'll just be like, oh, it, I, you know, things won't move and it hurts. No so I would guess that uh, this this pre work makes it much more likely that things adjust. For sure, yeah. So what pre work have you found works best? You know, some people do stim, pot, and cold packs. You know, some people do like physical, you know, kind of massage where they'll, I guess they'll hold the muscles in certain positions to help them relax. Like, what does your pre-work look like for patients? Typically, I'm going to use a set of warm-up exercises. The premise is based in the Pedibon system. So it's a bunch of movements that help activate the muscles, move the blood around, loosen up the system so that we can get more movement overall. And then if I do find areas that are completely stuck with a muscle spasm over it, I will release those muscle spasms before I even think about doing the adjustment. I look for some range of motion before I do the impulse of the adjustment. And if I can't achieve any of that range of motion, there's no point in doing the impulse. And we'll go back to doing some active movements, trying to release the area, making it easier for both of us to get it to move. Yeah, I've noticed when I go on trips and I come back, um, the first adjustment, not much adjusts, but the second one does. 
So I wonder if like impulsing a joint, even if it doesn't adjust, does that do anything? Does it signal the joint to maybe start releasing over a period of time or does the impulse backfire and make it harder to adjust later on? Yeah, the actual cracking noise really isn't necessary. The movement in and of itself, that high velocity, low amplitude movement helps reset the soft tissue in the surrounding areas. So in the muscles and in the ligaments, there's receptors that our body uses to tell where they're at in space or tell how tight they are. And whenever you do that impulse, regardless of the audible sound or not, those nerves or the nerve endings within those muscles and ligaments get reset to a degree and it helps make the brain pay attention to that particular area. And it does help release the muscles and the soft tissue. So probably the next time we'll be able to achieve something better. So you use the, um, I don't know if it's called a gun or not, the activator. I don't know what chiropractors call it. Besides yeah. the activator. There's a couple of different versions of it. Sometimes they'll call it the pro adjuster or an activator. Their premise is relatively the same. All of them have a little bit different function, but it's tool assisted adjusting is the way we like to kind of generalize that scenario. I do use it in certain cases, especially really acute car accidents or somebody that has a disc herniation or say an older female that has really bad osteoporosis, there's no way that I could do a diversified style adjusting without hurting them. So the adjuster does fill that gap for us, the gentler style of adjusting. Yeah, I've had it used on me and it seems to loosen up areas a little bit. And it sounds like they're typing a letter. He's typing it. it. Right. Yeah, or just a plea. Okay. So you do all those things. Do you find the need for stim or hot packs or cold packs or just the manual movement of the tissue and the exercises are enough? Right. I typically, if I'm going to do something like hot or cold or the stem, I'll send them home with a pre-work. So I don't want to do work here that's something easily achievable by the patient. I want to spend the time with expertise doing things that they can't do by themselves. Uh, that makes sense. Right. It makes a lot of sense. When people come to you when it's the first time, like what are some of the reasons that people will come to you as a chiropractor? I know everyone's different, but are there some commonalities that people tell you? More often than not, very few patients are acute. Most of them are going to come in and they have a re-exacerbation of a previous injury or some issue that they've had forever. So somebody will show up and say, I've had neck pain for the last two weeks and you know we'll get through it. We'll start talking about it. I mean, when's the first time you remember not having any kind of neck pain whatsoever? And they'll tell me high school or 20 years ago. And so the issues tend to build up to a point that they finally get where they want to take care of it or they need to take care of it because it's impacting some portion of their life. You know, it sounds like people live with these things for a long time before they get help. For sure. And people with headaches, right? They never knew that a chiropractor could help them with the headaches. And all of a sudden they're here saying, you're my last resort. I've been to the neurologist. I've taken all the pills. I've done all the things. Somebody recommended I see a chiropractor. And it's amazing the difference that we can make. Them. People wait so long. Is it, you know, just, I know historically chiropractors were looked down upon, you know, by medical doctors. I don't know if they still are today, but so do you think society still views chiropractors as a last resort and not uh, like quote unquote real medicine? I mean, I don't agree at all with that. I love chiropractors, but what do you see? I see that more and more the younger providers are referring to chiropractors more often, especially with the pain medicine, you know, the whole debacle going on with that. They're making more referrals for just generalized pain or idiopathic lumbar pain, something that they can't send them to a referral for a neurosurgeon or orthopedic surgeon. We tend to get them more and more from primary care physicians. I think the general public doesn't know what we do. I don't think there's a clear message from all of us together saying what we do or how we do it. And that leaves the mystery for the general public having no clue exactly what we do. They just think we're here for low back pain. You know, I'm sure you know the chain, the joint chiropractic. Do you think sure. the chain has helped or hurt chiropractors? I'm of the belief that it's given people a lower bar or barrier of, I think it's getting people to experience it and understand whether they like it or not. It gives people a foothold into understanding what we do. Typically the joint chiropractic offices will, if somebody has a serious injury, they'll make a good referral or push them to a more capable office that has x-rays or does some therapies or does some decompression or something like that. And so I think when they're run right, they're benefit for the chiropractic in total. Okay. Chiropractors seem to have strange hours. They have like reduced schedules on Tuesdays and Thursdays and they, you know, I don't know, they just seem to have a very unusual schedule. Why is that, do you think? Most offices, probably if it's a single doctor, it's strenuous working on patients all the time. So that's one reason that you'd probably have a reduced day once or twice a week. It's it's like working out all day. And if 
you're running eight to eight, four or five days a week, it's pretty difficult on your body. And sometimes we got to do our paperwork. That's the other side of it. So filling out all the paperwork and keeping track of all our notes and doing all the clerical work on the backside. Most of us are a business owner as well as a provider. So it's really difficult for us to find time outside of the hours that were open to make that work. Yeah. So how many uh, patients in a day, just to give people an idea, like how strenuous is it to adjust? If you do 30 patients in a day or 50, you know, what's really the limit physically for a lot of chiropractors where they just, you know, beyond that point, they're just exhausted. For me, once I get to the point that I'm seeing 80 or 90 adjustments in a day, that's where I get to the point that I can't, I can't quite keep it up back to back or day to day. Like in my office, I'd probably average 60 to 70 adjustments in a day. That's a lot. How much physical effort does it take to get through 60 or 70 people? Is it built up over time? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right off the bat, there's no way I was going to do it as effectively as I do now. And it's depending on the person, it takes a considerable amount of effort for some people, even even little tiny people. Sometimes they take even more effort than the, the really stocky guys. So it's really interesting just what it takes to get it done. Oh, why are some people harder to adjust than others? They just, they tense up, they can't relax. And so it makes it harder for you or what's the reason? Yeah, I think most of it's probably the subconscious or maybe they watch too many fighting movies where somebody broke their neck, but <laughs> some of it is the resistance to it. And if they can't relax, it's really difficult for us to get the adjustment that we need. And I'm having to, you know, be in a stooped posture for a minute, maybe two, working with the person, trying to ease them into the adjustment because I certainly don't want to put too much pressure on a muscle or cause any kind of spasm because I was just forcing my way through it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Okay. So what are the typical conditions that people come to you for? Is is it low back pain? Is it headaches? Um, you know, what are, let's say, the top three that people tell you they have problems with, say, what you're up on? I'd say number one is the low back pain. So more often than not, low back in the general population is going to be anywhere from the shoulder blades all the way down to the lower part of the butt. So any kind of low back pain, sciatica, that kind of stuff, they'll show up. That's number one for us. Uh, the next one would be neck pain that goes from either the base of the skull all the way up into the upper back or the traps. And that one seems to be more and more common. The more people are using computers or working from home and not having a good work set up, that one's getting more and more common. Ridiculous symptoms, so pain coming from the neck or the lower back running down the arms or legs is probably number three for us. We do get a lot of people that come in. Incidentally, they'll mention the headaches and never knew that we could help them with it. Doesn't seem to be the primary driver for most people to show up at the office. Okay. And then I know everyone's different, but should people just continue coming forever, at least to maybe a once a week pace or... What kind of pacing have you seen works for folks where they get the relief they want? Sure. In my office, I'm more of what you would consider a mixer. So there's two different camps of chiropractors, ones that believe the adjustment by itself is all that's necessary and others that'll add modalities. So like you were talking about the tinge units or the hot and cold packs. I like to incorporate a lot of structural rehab into my program so I can lay enough foundation that a person doesn't necessarily need the adjustment. They may want the adjustment at some point, but they don't need the adjustment. I do a lot of motion x-rays, so like a motion analysis to see where the subluxations are, how many there are, what direction they're stuck. And I use those as periodic checkups to figure out if they do need adjusting or what kind of frequency they would continue to need adjusting. So when people come in on their own, I mean, so if someone comes to you, you know, they have a problem at first and then they get relief. Do they, does a light bulb go on and they say, hmm, I'm going to start coming back on my own, you know, just regularly or... Like what makes the difference between a patient that will come regularly on their own and one that will only come for a little while and just doesn't come again because they've gotten relief and they don't want to come again for some reason? Yeah, there's definitely a component to the first day or two that we're having conversations. And as long as it's clear in my description or understanding of how this occurred and why it was there and why it will continue to come, even if we do an adjustment or two, if they don't restructure their body to some degree... That seems to be the patient that as long as they understand what I'm trying to tell them and how it works, they tend to continue regardless of the level of pain because they know that they need to change something. Some patients that are just, you know, their neck's killing them, dying, we do the adjustment and they feel like they're 100%. Usually we'll see them again within six to nine months, but that first time, sometimes it's only that one or two adjustments and they feel great and they just go on to the next place. Yep. All right. Would that be seen when someone gets chiropractic? Like what happens to someone structurally if they get 
typically if, if a patient's had any kind of structural deviation for, I'd say, six months or more, their body's reformed a tremendous amount of their soft tissue. So like the ligaments, the disc, and the muscles have really changed their operating procedure to reset to a new normal. The most common thing that we think of is that normally a person has a C-shaped curve in their neck that goes back to front. If we have a subluxation for six to nine months, typically that C-shaped curve goes away and we start to recruit the wrong muscles to support our body. Once we have those wrong muscles supporting the body, our body has a very poor mechanism of resetting back to normal. Those more long-term patients will induce that normal range of motion. In my office, I'll train those muscles to work again. If we can get those two working in unison again, we'll start to see the reformation of normal structure, soft tissue, the ligaments and the discs over that year time. Because in that construct, the thing that takes the longest cellularly repair would be the disc. Usually that's close to a year that your body's going to take to reform a disc from its state it was. And ligaments, for instance, they take 240 days to reform. So if you had a tighter ligament that was supporting the structure, we need to do that to change its shape. It would usually take us 240 days to see the change in that. So... Oh, wow. Um, the muscles rehab very quickly, though. The cellular turnover of a muscle is about 90 days. My working premise is that if we can get the muscles to work, we can unlock the joints or get that range of motion at the same time we get those muscles. That's where the solution lies because your body really has to be able to maintain that range of motion just because you get adjusted. I don't know, even if you're getting adjusted three times a week, that's only for a small moment in time. Uh, your body still has to be able to maintain that movement. What about ligaments and tendons? What role do they play and how can anyone you know, improve their function? Ligaments and tendons, they're really what supports the structure because as much as we think a chiropractor is moving bones, the bone itself usually is not the issue. It, it's the things attached to the bone. So the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the discs, all the things that keep it in space. That's really the thing that gets injured in a soft tissue injury, a slip and fall, car accidents. Any number of postural changes also strain those ligaments to the point that they have to restructure to be able to maintain that poor posture or deviation. So having the appropriate stresses and pressures on those muscles and ligaments will help them reform back to their normal. What about an injury from car accidents or workplace injuries? Or you know, I've seen around town uh, injury chiropractic, emergency chiropractic. You do uh, injury work you know, car crashes or workplace accidents and, you know, what does that look like? Sure. I do personal injury. I have a lot of postgraduate work through uh, SUNY Buffalo and training for how to assess, diagnose, and treat personal injury patients, whether it be a slip and fall, car accident, roller coaster, or something like that. The biggest thing that we're going to assess is the, so the level of soft tissue damage. A lot of people don't know that muscles are the most easily and readily damaged. They're typically brain strained before we rupture a ligament or we blow out a disc or we dislocate a joint. And that's the biggest thing that we'll pay attention to in the beginning for the smaller soft tissue injuries. The larger ones, so a significant whiplash injury, we're going to think of the damage to the ligaments. Once we structurally damage a ligament, we become unstable, right? So we think two joints will have too much range of motion relative to each other. And the response of the body in that situation is going to be to cause a muscle spasm to hold it all in place. Its ultimate goal is to protect the nervous system and not have any damage to that. And that fixation is going to cause us a lot of discomfort, pain, swelling, inflammation. Mm. That's where we start to see the issues. We do a number of different analyses via the x-rays to figure out if there's any ligament instability or damage to determine what type of care, what frequency of care we need. MRIs are very helpful for this. It tells us if we have a disc herniation, the level of the disc herniation, the damage that's around that soft tissue so that we can figure out how we need to treat it, what level of treatment is appropriate in the beginning, and where we need to go for the end. Okay. So in a car accident, for instance, things are being moved violently. Why does it seem to take sometimes a day or two for someone to feel the effects of a car accident, for instance? Some of the things that we're injuring, say the ligaments or the disc, have very little blood flow to them. So the inflammation cascade or the process of inflammation takes sometimes 72 hey, hours. Oh, no. So is that why it takes a day or two sometimes to feel your injuries in a car accident? Yeah. The peak of inflammation from a trauma injury is going to take upwards of 72 hours. So typically patients will either feel it right away or they'll continue to get worse for the next three days. Why is that? The body is uh, like what's happening in their body that takes, you know, three days, let's say, for them to feel the 
the extent of their injury. Yeah, the things that become injured typically within the car accident, so not just the muscles, but the ligaments and tendons and the disc have less blood flow than, say, your ankle does. That blood flow regulates how quickly our body can get the repairman to that area, and that's what causes the inflammation. So as it starts to build up over the next day or two, as it's building up those cells in that surrounding tissue so that it can rebuild it, that's where all the inflammation starts to occur. And anywhere there's inflammation, it can start to push and press on other delicate parts. So say the nerves between the joints or the nerves that exit the spine, and that's where we'll start to see more and more of those symptoms. Okay, that makes sense. I see. Well, very good. Where are you located in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, and where do you tend to get people that you treat what cities? Sure. Central to downtown Dallas. I'm in the Baylor Hospital Complex. It's just north of downtown Dallas. We take it, patients from the surrounding areas. So as far as Irving, as far as Richardson, all of Dallas proper, and we go south. We see a lot of people from, we now even have patients coming from Red Oak. So anywhere from a 45 minute to an hour drive from the office. Okay, very good. And what's the best place for people to find out more about your office? Where can they go? Sure. My website's texasfhc.com, so Texas Functional Health Centers. That's the best place to find us on our website. We do have a Facebook page, Instagram, all those fun things if you want to check out any of the videos and whatnot, all under Texas Functional Health Centers. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. Sure. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to The Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 